and uh, I want you to turn with your Bibles into uh, Second Peter, which I think is the best of the two books, but depends on what you like. <laughs> Second Peter gets a lot deeper and explains a lot of things. Okay, keep in mind that he is he is uh, ministering to the Jews in Babylon, not Rome. As far as we know, he never, was never in Rome, you know. Babylon. Uh, most of the people went west, he went east. Okay, now we're going to start in chapter 1 of Second Peter. Simon Peter, a servant, and an apostle of Jesus Christ to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. I want you to notice, you know, in all the old letters they used to, uh, in the salutation, they told who it was that was writing them. We don't do that today. We say, dear sir, and then we sign it at the bottom. But they always uh, put it at the beginning. And he gives his title, which is a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, last week he said he was an elder. But remember, that was only a gift, not an office. He was never an elder as an officer. Uh, an office, that is, uh, in the church. Uh, there are gift, there are most probably most of everyone in this church are elders, but you're not uh, you're not a bishop, <laughs> which would be the office. <laughs> All right. Uh, now we uh, as we get through this, we see that uh, he's talking to all those who have obtained a like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God. And our Lord Jesus Christ, and grace and peace be multiplied unto you through knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. It's interesting. Uh, Peter here talks about mathematics, <laughs> multiplying. <laughs> Paul never used that term. Paul says the grace and the peace that passes all understanding. <laughs> Peter says, the grace and the peace be multiplied unto you. So, uh, he uses different terminology. Now, from verse 2, uh, let me see. Verse 2 down uh, in the first, uh, next two verses, uh, he uses the word knowledge. And I don't know, there may be a couple other places. Verse 2, knowledge, which is the, uh, which is not just knowledge of Christ, that is salvation. That's, that's gnosis. This is the epinosis, or meaning the full knowledge. That's the Greek word, full knowledge, and the full knowledge is the wisdom that God has given us concerning the kingdom, and all the kingdom truths that we know of, which is First of all, you get your spirit saved, and second of all, you get your you, you are getting your soul saved, <laughs> and that salvation of the soul, which will be, uh, and we've seen this in past studies, which will be uh, given to those who are worthy of it at the judgment seat of Christ, speaks of entering into the kingdom. Salvation of the soul. These are overcomers. And now our soul is being saved daily through faith, through the things that God allows to happen in our life and we overcoming them. All right, now we know what God has, bef uh, has uh, somewhat what he has waiting for us, what he's going to give all those overcomers. And it's far beyond uh, our little puny minds to, to even conceive. All right, grace and peace. Notice it's not peace and grace. You can never get peace and then grace. You get grace first and then peace. <laughs> grace comes from God. Then the peace is the fruit of the grace, which is what you get. Grace and peace. 
be multiplied unto you through the epinosis knowledge, the full knowledge and wisdom of God and of Jesus our Lord. So this book may have a special place in your hearts because Peter now is talking about that portion that speaks of reward entering into the kingdom. All right. Verse 3, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the epinosis knowledge. Again, the full, the full knowledge, the full knowledge, the wisdom. And remember that, uh, that uh, wisdom uh, is the beginning. Actually, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. So people will tell you, Christians, that they don't fear God. And there's something wrong with their life, I guarantee you, because fearing God is natural and it's healthy. God wants us to fear. And one of the spirits of Christ is the spirit that Christ had is the spirit of the fear of God himself, which you'll find in the 11th chapter of Isaiah. All right. Uh, he has given us divine, us his divine power. And he hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the full wisdom, through the full knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Now he has, uh, he has already given you all things that pertain to life. <laughs> we just don't recognize them. We have to begin thanking God for what we have. And, uh, putting our faith in him that he will reveal what he already has for us from day to day for us. And it's through faith that we, uh, we receive these things. Uh, well, unto life and godliness, being godly. And uh, this is all through the full knowledge. And he's called us to glory and virtue. Actually, uh, it could be by glory and virtue. He's called us by glory and virtue. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers or co-heirs of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Again, he is just telling us again about what God has for us, what is waiting for us, and, and uh, this all is according to the salvation of the soul. We, uh, uh, having escaped the corruption, is in the world through lust. Uh, first of all, that uh, began at our salvation, is continuing through the salvation of the soul. So, the exceeding great and precious promises brings uh, to thought to me uh, in Ephesians, uh, back in Ephesians chapter 1, if you want to turn there with me, uh, all of you have read this many times I know, but we're going to go back and read it again. Let me mark my Bible here so I don't lose my place. I can flip back to it. All right, now start over again. Ephesians chapter one. Again, part of uh, this 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 part of Paul's prayer, where he's praying for the Ephesians, who's already saved. In verse sixteen, he says, "I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers." What is part of his prayer? That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. That's the full knowledge. And it has to come through the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Uh, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. You know, that's a thrill when you've been t talking to a Christian and he don't understand any of these things and all of a sudden, whoop, he lights up. <laughs> uh, teaching 
classes on the Bible, you know, with the with the kingdom, and they and they begin to show show them things, and they begin to see it, you know, and they just they light up like a light. Uh, they begin to understand. They're being enlightened. That, and then he continues that you may know what is the hope of his calling. In other words, the hope of you being saved, and what, and what? Uh, let me see. And what the riches of the glory of his inheritance, literally among the saints, instead of in is a better Greek word among the saints. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us word who believe? According to the working of his mighty power. Now that word believe there, according to us, uh, to us word who believe is a, is a present uh, tense, uh, well it's an active participle, meaning you're doing it continuously because present tense calls for continuous action. And, it, and it's what it is here is a continuing belief of growth or a growth of believing. Uh, you just don't get saved, do nothing the rest of your life and get anything from God. You get the only thing you get, and he guaranteed that to you, and the guarantee is eternal life. You get heaven, but that's all. <laughs> I've had people actually say, well, that's all I want. <laughs> I don't want to know anything else. <laughs> I just, uh, I can't understand that. They just want to get in by the skin of their teeth. When God has so much more for us. All right, so Paul brings it out a different way. His prayer was that their eyes of their understanding uh, would be enlightened and that they may know the hope. Uh, that they may know this, the riches of this glory of his inheritance and the great power to us who believe. All this... Uh, is going to be in the future for us and you know where we where we may make a mistake in our thinking is well that's many years away I won't worry about it now I understand it yeah yeah and it's going to be way out there for me to get it it could be by tomorrow <laughs> could be by tonight scripture says uh, death is appointed unto men one time or men appointed unto death one time and after this, the judgment. So the next event in your life after death or the rapture is the judgment. And either one could happen tonight. So it's that close. Going back to Second Peter. He continues with this, uh, uh, with this uh, actually speaking of us gaining these things, these exceeding great and precious promises. Uh, by verse 5, and he says, And besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. Now, there's some things we can begin adding to our life as we work on these things. And, of course, uh, when he says add to your faith uh, virtue, he says fortitude. We're talking about fortitude and to fortitude knowledge. You know what fortitude is, don't you? Never giving up. We get the word from the word fort. Can't get no, the devil can't get in. I don't give up. <laughs> Holding the line. And then knowledge. Add to that knowledge. And this is epinosis again. Uh, the deeper knowledge or the higher knowledge, however you want to say it. You see the word epi in front of it is a preposition that can mean several things. It can mean above knowledge. Knowledge that's above all the other knowledge. Uh, it's interpreted probably most time by most people as full knowledge. It can be uh, interpreted super knowledge. <laughs> super knowledge. All right. As we understand that, then you are adding to our fortitude uh, knowledge, super knowledge, and to our super knowledge temperance, which is self control. <laughs> and to temperance, that is self control. To patience, which is means endurance, long-suffering, 
you know, patience. And to patience, godliness, that's piety. And to godliness, brotherly kindness. And we don't have to interpret that. And to brotherly kindness, charity, which is love. All right, these things we need to work on in our life. What we need to do as Christians, knowing all these things, is to think, come to think like Christ thinks and acts like Christ acts. And he's told us um, in many places of the Bible, Peter told us in the last book, he says, for instance, uh, honor, to honor all people, love the brotherhood. That honor all people will do away with our negative thinking about them. <laughs> we see somebody's roar, roar. Look at that stupid so and so. <laughs> Look what he's doing. <laughs> Immediately we get some negative thoughts about other people. God says, don't have negative thoughts. Be very, very positive. Every man that's walking upon this face of the earth has dignity. Honor him as a man. Don't, necess don't necessarily uh, follow him in what he's doing, but honor him and obey the king or, in this sense, the government, those that are over you. And he put a lot of uh, emphasis on how Jesus would think if he would be here. Negative thinking uh, gets us really down in the dumps ourselves. We need to be positive, and we can only be positive by knowing what God has for us. And allowing Christ to live his life through us. That doesn't mean to say that negative, negative, being negative <laughs> in certain things is bad. Now, what's I'm trying to say? Negativity is this? Yeah. Negativity. What is it? Negativity. 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 Okay, good for you. Thank you. <laughs> the Bible's full of negatives. God says, don't do this and don't do that. That's negative. The Ten Commandments is negative, <laughs> except for a few. <laughs> so, uh, you know, positives can't really be positives without some negatives. But um, think the best about people and don't let negative thinking uh, turn into hate, bad thinking, which actually is destructive to you and not to the other person. We need then to work, constantly work on adding to our faith fortitude and, and knowledge and self-control and patience and piety and brotherly kindness and love. Love the brotherhood. Brotherly kindness we can use to anyone, but love the brotherhood, which is those who are saved. <laughs> uh, all right, let's continue here. And uh, when we get down to verse 9, we begin, he says, But he that lacketh these things is blind. And he's talking about spiritually blind. And cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. That's word blind is better translated nearsighted or shortsighted. Doesn't that... Uh, in your book, uh, describe uh, so many Christians today. <laughs> They're short-sighted. They can't see afar off. They forgot that they was purged from their old sins. And then verse 10, Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. Now, two things are there, isn't there? Calling is when you were saved. The election is, when, is what you have from God concerning the wisdom, the fact that he has chosen you to see the deeper things. Uh, calling and election, two things. Calling, references to the salvation of the spirit, election to the salvation of the soul, and rewards. So make them sure. And if you do these things, ye shall never fall. Now verse 11 is important. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. All right, that's the kingdom, but I want you to notice he uses the everlasting portion, not the 1,000-year kingdom. 
Uh, P- Peter, uh, Peter didn't have uh, Paul's gospel. Paul, the only one had his gospel concerning the bride of Christ, the Gentile bride of Christ. He speak, he's speaking here to a bunch of Jews who were saved. Now, of course, they're members of the church. But uh, the everlasting kingdom, of course, is the, king, is the kingdom of God after the millennium. But in order to enter that, you have to enter it through the millennium. And if you, and I, this, I think this is good proof here, if you gain a reward in the millennium or during the kingdom age, you'll have it forever and ever into the everlasting kingdom. Okay. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly in the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That means the doors will fling wide open for you. Now verse 12, Wherefore I will not be negligent to, be, to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them and be established in the, in the present truth. I think of my own ministry so many times you probably get tired of me hearing me <laughs> preach over and over and over and over the same things. That's what Peter's saying here. He says, wherefore I will not be ne negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them, and be established in the present truth. And then he says, yeah, I think it meet, or good. We can take that word meet and translate it into the word good, G-O-D. Yeah, I think it good as long as I am in this body, tabernacle, his body, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. So every Sunday I stir you all up put you in remembrance <laughs> and I think that's of course that's basically my my ministry knowing that shortly I must put off this tabernacle or body even as our Lord Jesus Christ had showed me moreover I will endeavor that you may be able after my decease to have these things always in remembrance I'm going to keep telling you and over and over and over till they stick <laughs> Now, verse 16. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory of this is my beloved son in, son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. All right, now we get to the subject of prophecy. And today we have a great uh, host of preachers in churches who said, don't know anything about it, don't want to know about it. All I want to know is Jesus uh, crucified and, and saved, being saved. That's all. And the same group sometimes uh, will criticize other preachers who preach it by saying, the only thing is, only marks he's got in his Bible is in Revelation and Daniel. <laughs> all right. It's one of the premier... Uh, truths of the Bible, that is prophecy, two-thirds of the Bible is prophecy. Prophecy is history that is yet to come to pass. History is prophecy that has been fulfilled. Christianity is the only, the only religion in the world, if you want to put it that way, that has a system of prophecy because it's the only true religion. And the word religion I don't like. It is not a religion. Christianity is a person. It's Christ. All right. He says, now, we didn't follow in a bunch of, uh, you know, devised fable, uh, fables. We didn't make up a bunch of stories when we were telling you about the power and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's coming. He's going to give his reward is what he's saying. He says, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We saw him coming. You say, well, Jesus hadn't come back at this time, so how could they have seen him? Well, he gives you that verse 17 and verse 18, which was an incident that happened in Matthew 17, upon the Mount of Transfiguration. 
For the benefit of our taped audience, we'll turn over there for them. That's in Matthew chapter 17. We'll go exactly to where uh, uh, Peter's talking about here. <clears throat> and after six days, beginning in verse 1, and after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with him. Then Peter answered, or then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make three here, three tab tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elias. While he yet speak, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. When you read that and then read over here in Peter where we read a while ago, I'm glad that Peter finally got it. Because he wanted to make Jesus equal, bring Jesus down and make them equal with Moses and Elijah. He wanted to make free tabernacles. <laughs> and God's voice then comes and said, this is my son. <laughs> This is my son. And, uh, and uh, then, of course, he says, hear ye him. This is my beloved son whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Now, this is important. This is what we call a pattern of prophecy or a miniature of prophecy being fulfilled. It didn't literally, this is not the literal coming of Christ. But it is the same as he come, he came. And this is. Uh, during that time, and it is um, uh, in this pattern of prophecy, God is saying the real coming is going to be the same way. So what you're seeing here is the same as the second coming. You can be eyewitnesses. When you eyewitness this, you eyewitness the second coming. Now John, of course, when he wrote the book of Revelation, was caught up into heaven and he witnessed again the coming of Christ, but he witnessed it in its, in its time zone, or in the time, I'd say the time when he comes, in the time, or the zone uh, of time when he would really come, and that zone was the real time, and he was then, as he was caught up in the heaven, was moved forward into time to actually see it in its uh, real time. While he was on earth, he saw the miniature of it. Now, it's interesting before we leave chapter 17. And after six days, a day with the Lord is a thousand years. <laughs> and after six days, the second coming. After 6,000 years, after the day of man. And the reason I mention that is because in this third chapter, later on, Peter's going to say a day with the Lord is a thousand years to show us that uh, there is a 6,000 years of prophecy until the Lord Jesus Christ comes back. And then there'll be another thousand years in which he will rule and reign. Now, if we take this thousand, these 6,000 years and this 7,000th year and bring it back down to the day, which is a day is a 1,000 years and a 1,000 years is a day, we see the creation in which God made all things in six days. Man rested on the seventh. And then man sinned and God says, well, I've got to go back to work for another, for another six, day, for six days. Yeah, right. Total of seven with the seventh rest. Except now... Each day is going to represent a thousand years. That's the story of redemption. We're living right near the close of the of Friday night, midnight, getting close. <laughs> Redemption's about here. <laughs> totally. All right. Now, uh, there you see in the 17th chapter of uh, Matthew, you see how this pattern of prophecy is played out. 
And, P and the mountain speaks of his kingdom. Mountain in the scriptures always speaks of kingdom. And uh, Peter, James, and John were invited to be with him in his kingdom at his coming. They are representatives of those who will be in the kingdom. But also, there are two others. And uh, these are Moses and Elias. Moses died and was resurrected, or he wouldn't be here. <laughs> he wasn't resurrected. And then Elias, who was never died, he was raptured. They are representatives of the church, those who will be raised from the dead at the rapture, and those who will, uh, who have died, who will be raised from the dead, and then those who will be translated, that is Elijah. Representative of the church. The rest of his apostles were down at the bottom of the mountain. They had no power to do anything because they had no faith. So all this is representative of people. And if you want to see something that's really interesting, you can turn to where, again, this, this scripture is used. About the six days. Let me see if I can find it for you. Uh, I think it's Mark 9, 2. Uh, Nope, that's the wrong. That's the wrong one. Let me let me look back here again at my notes. Let's try um, Luke nine eight twenty eight. Nine and twenty eight. Uh, verse twenty eight. And it came to pass about an eighth days after these after these sayings, he took Peter and John. And James and went up into the mountain to pray. Now we have eight days. <laughs> Why? Because it's a different pattern of prophecy. He's not talking about this world. The eighth day is the new heaven and the new earth. After the seventh day, the, the earth is destroyed. All right. Then God creates the new heaven and the new earth. And it came to pass about an eight days, and he says about an eight days after these sayings, he took Peter, John, Peter and John and James and went up into the mountain to pray. Of course, uh, in 429, he prayed and was fashioned of his countenance was altered and his raiment was white and glistering. And behold, there taught with them two men, which was Moses and Elias, who appeared in glory. You won't find that in Matthew. And the reason for it is, during the kingdom age, we don't shine. Jesus is the only one that shines. We share in his glory. But in the eighth day, which is the kingdom of God, and is the eternal ages, they will appear in glory. They'll shine. According to Matthew chapter 13, uh, they will shine as the sun. So that's just a little bit of interesting uh, thing that you can show, show how accurate Scripture is. I want to go back to Peter now. All right, as we look here in verse 19 of the first chapter, we also, we have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take, take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your heart. Okay, he's saying that we have the prophecy. We know what it is. Uh, we have a more sure word of prophecy, as a matter of fact. Uh, down verse 20, it says, knowing this first, that no prophecy of this scripture is of any private interpretation. We didn't get it uh, just by making it up. This is something uh, that uh, God gave to us and we even witnessed. Now, I want to show you something. Uh, what God thinks about prophecy. Turn to Revelation 19.10. I think you're going to discover that Jesus has a testimony himself. All right. And I fell at his feet to worship him, and he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant, 
and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So you want the testimony of Jesus? Then you want the spirit of prophecy, you will study prophecy. What is yet to be. Going back to 2 Peter chapter 2, uh, he said that this is prophecy that he himself witnessed, he saw, and uh, that when he gets through here in verse 19, says, We have a more sure word of prophecy, where until you do well that you take heed. And what's it like unto? It's, un it's likened unto a light that shineth in a dark place. So the testimony of Jesus is as a light that shineth in a dark place, and it's prophecies. It, it, uh, it shines to let you know where to walk. <laughs> we named our church Lamp and Light. Lamp, the lamp is the Word of God. It's a light unto my path. Uh, it's a lamp unto my feet. It's a light unto my path. We, I can know where I'm walking now and know where I'm going to walk. That's prophecy. All right. It says, unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn. That's the coming of the Lord. Now, when the day dawns, there will be this, the Lord will be, this truth is called uh, the morning star. Jesus with the rapture is the morning star. But when he comes back to the earth to rule and reign, he will be the day star meaning the bright and morning star arise in your hearts. And the way this happens, arising in your hearts, is when you know the testimony of Jesus, which is the spirit of prophecy. Verse 21, for the prophecy came not in old time. Literally, the word old is any time. So, for the prophecy came not in any time by the will of man. But holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. See how vigorously Peter defends those who study prophecy and, and prophecy, which is, the, which is a testimony of Jesus. When somebody turns, you know, turns, the, <clears throat> turns down the knowledge of wanting to learn prophecy, you know they don't have the spirit of Jesus, the spirit of prophecy, which is the witness of Jesus. It's very important. If you don't know prophecy, you don't know how to interpret the rest of the Bible. All right, that will uh, close us up tonight, this first chapter. And quickly going back, uh, Peter is telling the great and precious promises that are for us because we have the epinosis knowledge. We are to continue in it. And as a matter of fact, to add to it. Add fortitude, knowledge, self-control, piety, brotherly kindness, and love so that a great uh, entrance would be ministered to us into the everlasting kingdom. To get into the everlasting kingdom, those things that we do now, we get into the millennial kingdom, and they remain forever and ever even into the everlasting kingdom. Remember, what you do for Christ now lasts forever. There's no such thing as being promoted once you leave this world. If you leave this world and you don't have any reward, you'll never have any. You can't earn any anymore. That's it. It's forever and ever. Because they must be earned, you see, through faith. There's no faith there. Everything is by sight. That's why faith is so precious. Actually, that's why this life is so precious, because we have to live by faith. No, we don't have to. Some of us try to live by sight without any faith whatsoever, but God wants us to live by faith. We're saved by faith, for by grace are you saved through faith. And uh, we live by faith every day to overcome the, uh, the hardships of life and the things that are thrown at us, trusting in the Lord. All right, finally, he defends prophecy, telling us that the Lord will come back and that he had, an, he had a part, personal part in this. He was an eyewitness to it. 
and that his that the prophecy that the, that he teaches was not by any kind of uh, of uh, fabled you know somebody making something up. He was a part of it, and that prophecy came not in any time by the will of man. Man can't make up prophecy, but by the but by the uh, will of God. And uh, as men spake, as God told them what to say. Father, thank you for the hour and these precious truths that we have seen. Bless them to our hearts. Dismiss us now in your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.